um, read a, uh, a verse to you that just goes to the message God laid on my heart this morning, and then we'll pray, and we'll get in the message. Um, hope you will follow along in, in the Bible with us, all right? This is 2 Timothy 3.16, and all this is stuff we have to learn as we're in Christ. We're always lifelong learners. We're always growing. We're always learning. I hope you are. It's very important. So this is what this says. It says, all scripture, all, all of this is God breathed and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting. And this is really important. This one, I want you to think about this and training in righteousness. We, we need trained in that. And that'll come into the message later. So that the servant of God, which is what we learn we are, it's the greatest thing you can ever do with your life. It'll change your life. It'll change your legacy. It'll change your family. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work which God wants to do through you, which is more than you could ever dream. Let's pray. God, we pray now. We turn to you, and I pray that you would just uh, speak and do your thing. First, I pray uh, that everybody that's newer with us or visiting or been away a while or in a bad place this morning just feels really welcome and at peace, like this is all right, this is safe, this is all right. And I pray that every one of us would hear from you this morning and be challenged. This is unbelievably powerful. So there is stuff that would want us not to hear this and not to have this power in our life. We want to claim the victory, we want to hear this, we want to be able to apply it to our life. We want to have the best life we can possibly have for you. So God, may we apply your teaching to our lives and learn to live for something bigger than ourselves. Do your thing. We ask this in Jesus' name. Let's all agree and say amen. All righty, awesome. Um, I want to ask you a personal question um, to begin with. So if you, if you would, lean in. Just lean in a little bit. Lean in, lean in. Here's my personal question. Do any of you, or is it just me, ever have totally messed up thoughts? I mean, like, scary, like, yeah, I don't want anybody to know I have thoughts like this. Like, this isn't normal. Are any of you ever a little bit of a whack job? <laughs> yeah. The truth is, we all are. We may not talk about that much, but the truth is, big time. Now, here's where we're going to go today, and I'm just going to give you this and, and teach to it. But this is so important. Such a huge idea. Jesus came. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to give us victory over our thoughts. Ton of other stuff too, but make sure you get this. Jesus came to give us victory over our thoughts. And we showed last week Golgotha, which means the, the place of the skull, which is where Jesus died for us. And there's this skull. From now on, when you think of, of, of the death and the resurrection, you think of skull and you remember that Jesus came to give you victory over your thoughts. All of them. Huge idea. Huge idea. So that leads to our first point. Jesus didn't just come to give you eternal life. He came to give you a victorious life. And so many people in churches don't even get that. They think that Jesus came just to get us to heaven, which is part of the deal. But Jesus came to give you this victorious life. Now you can be saved and on your way to heaven and be totally held captive, be totally in bondage in here. Totally. Paul was in prison when he wrote the scripture we're going to study and he was free, but you can be here and be totally through an addiction, through messed up thinking, through stuff as a child you thought about yourself. And many of you know people like that. Many of you know people and some of you are wrestling with that right now. Um, so Jesus came to set us free. Listen to this in every single area of life, every area. Now, when I first came to church, I didn't believe that. I'm like, I know that God cares about God's stuff. What I didn't understand was God cares about every part of your life. And here's the way the Bible explains it so that everybody can get it, especially parents. It's like me and I have four kids and I fell in love with God. So I quit a career to do the God thing and be a pastor. So obviously all of you know, I have four kids. I care about God in their life. Duh. But even though I care about God in their life, do I care about uh, the relationships in their life? Oh yeah. Do I care about their finances? Oh yeah. Do I care whether they're happy or sad in every single part of their life? Absolutely. And the Bible says 
that just pales into comparison to how much God loves you and cares about every area of your life. So he wants you to be victorious in every area of your life. You're like, whoa, God wants me to have better finances, a better sex life, a better, yes, absolutely. And I just want to make sure you understand that before we go on. He wants to give you a better life in all areas of life. Now, we need to understand this. There's this idea that we have to learn as we grow spiritually, and here it is. We all wrestle with messed up thoughts, but a big part of this is we all wrestle with lies in our head and they're lies. And the biggest thing about a lie in your head is to recognize it and recognize it's there. Many of you, I've told you this before, but it's so, so true. I have been, and and it, praise God, it doesn't happen much, but it happened a lot in the old building. And and I would be in the middle of a sermon, like right now, and, and, and just preaching, teaching, whatever you want to call it. And in the back of my head, in the back of my head is this total reality. It is so real, it's not even funny, that while I'm talking to you, and I keep talking, I'm hearing this in the back of my head, man, Mike, you are the worst preacher in the history of the world. This is horrible. And I would, say, I would think everyone, like there, there's my friend Joe. And I would be thinking, you know what? Joe's my friend, but he totally feels sorry for me right now. He's like, dude, you should sit down. This is horrible. No, I, I, I'm telling you, I would believe everybody thought that. This is horrible, dude. Please just sit down and do us all a favor. This is horrible. And that would be a reality to me. Now, where does that come from? Do you know? the enemy. And the Bible says that. The Bible says that. John chapter 8, that the enemy is, what's the enemy's job description? It's to come on Halloween with the pitchfork and red mask, right? No, the enemy is just the father of lies. It's to keep you from greatness. And so I'm telling you that all of you have some place that the enemy is in your head and lies to you. You could never be great. You could never kick that addiction. You could never be happily married. You could never have victory over your health. You could never have victory here. And that is a lie from the enemy. And we just need to acknowledge that we all have that in our minds. So um, here's, that leads to the next point. Here it is. You're only as free as your mind is free. We all know people that let other people live rent free in their head, right? They're just consumed with some person. And they just go on and on. It's like, are you ever going to get over that? Because you're like not even living life right now. You're just consumed with that thing, you know? And we can all live with stuff in our head that just stops us from being free. I'm going to give some examples of that in, in a minute for me. But it's just huge. So think right now, because I hope we all want to grow and change, about an area in your life you want to change. That could be your finances. It could be your health. It could be your spiritual life. Just think of it, your marriage, an area you want to change. And I guarantee you, the key to changing this area of your life is to change your thoughts. I guarantee you. And so that's what we're going to talk about, how to do that today, this powerful way to do that. So next point is, and I want to make sure you understand this, that the mind here is the main battlefield of good and evil. It's the main battlefield and evil doesn't look like what we thought it looked like. If we can just stop you from living the greatest life in the world that God wants to give you, then the enemy's happy. If he can stop you from that, he's totally, if he can get you to coast through life and just live for you and live and make it all about you, he's happy. He's real happy. Make sure you understand. So the mind is the main battlefield of good and evil. So here's what second Corinthians says. It tells us it already builds a case for what we do and how we have victory over the mind, over our thoughts, over that, you know, messed up thinking. It says the weapons we fight with, they're not what you think. Okay, that's cool. They have divine power. Now that sounds pretty powerful, divine power. I said last service, I'll do it again just to see, because everybody looked at me like, that's, I have no idea what you're talking about. Does anybody else ever remember the good old days? You wake up Saturday morning and you watch cartoons. And does anybody remember Wonder Twin Powers? Thank you. See, second service. they totally culturally relevant. They get it. Wonder Twin Powers activate. And it'd be shape of and form of. And I wasn't even a cartoon guy, but I remember Wonder Twin Powers. But we're not talking about Wonder Twin Powers, which were pretty awesome, but fake. We're talking about real power, divine power, the power from God. And here's how we have it. Here is the power from God. It's wild because you think, 
well, the power from God comes from coming to church. No, the power from God comes, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Make it obedient to here. We learn to change our thoughts because that's what changes our lives. Okay, cool, cool. So the big idea is God will help you change your thoughts for the better, for the better. We all got a place we need to change our thoughts. God will help you change them for the better. Um, I was eight years old and... It's a true story. Some of you know this. I was at the front of Cedar Point, and for whatever reason, um, my dad told me, stand right here, and my dad just knocked me out cold. Just boom, eight years old. And I did not know how much that messed me up until I got older. And so my whole life after that, my identity was, I must be a pretty bad kid. Now, some parents joke about that like that's funny, I'm going to challenge you after today. Don't joke about that. So then I always got in trouble, seventh through ninth grade. And again, it was maybe kind of fun. Everybody joked, Mike's always in trouble. Mike Berry's always in trouble. So my identity, though, became I'm a bad kid and I'm always in trouble. Now, we played church at this church in Vandalia. And, and the pastor's kids lived in the same plat I lived in. And they introduced me to a magazine called Playboy. Anybody here ever read Playboy? Go ahead and raise this off. Now that people started it. Uh, Playboy, which back in the day was like hardcore point, right? I mean, but today, like, that's the best you got. I mean, come on. That's TV today. But Playboy, and that opened up this crazy sexual teenage stuff going crazy that I thought it was just me that wrestled with. So now I'm bad kid, and I'm a pervert, and I'm just... And I'm just a mess. God must hate me. But then from the time I started drinking and drug, and I never drank or drug socially, so I was just off to the races, and I'm a real alcoholic, drug addict, and a rotten sinner. And that was my identity. Now, I got sober in AA, okay? And I became successful in the engineering field. And I climbed the corporate ladder, dude. I'm, 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 I'm helping open an office, project manager, a lot of success, hiring lots of people, making money, toys, stuff. And it's like, dude, I am very successful, but I wasn't free. Make sure you hear that. Paul was in prison, but he was free. I was very successful, but I wasn't free. I became, I caught on fire for Jesus, became a pastor. Now hear me, I wasn't free. What happened to me was, I uh, had a pastor friend and we were talking one day at this conference at lunch and he said, how's your church? He said, it's great. It's amazing God can do all this with a pastor who's a rotten sinner alcoholic. And he said, what? I said, our church is incredible. It's a, it's a miracle. It's amazing God can do all this with a pastor that's a rotten sinner alcoholic. And he looked at me and he said, he got red. I, would say, I don't know if anybody says that anymore. Some of you remember days we say, you got red. Forget all that. You had to know Wonder Twins to get red, okay? Anyways, and he goes, he goes, you are not a rotten sinner alcoholic and don't you ever call yourself that. I'm like, what? He said, don't you ever, ever call yourself that. Because if you think that way about yourself, you will never be free. And this guy had a lot of courage. I was 343 pounds and mean, and he poked me in the chest. And he said, you are the righteousness of Christ. And don't you ever forget that. And he said, until you get that, you will never be free. Wow. And you know what? He was right. He was right. He was absolutely right. And for you, whatever it is in your title that you've called yourself, until you get that out of there and understand you are the righteousness of Christ, you are the, you got to get this from here. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are God's workmanship until you understand that, which only comes from God's word. You will never be totally free. And God wants you to be free and to soar. And you can't until you change your thoughts, change your thoughts. So this is such a big idea. So, um, how does all this work? Well, I gave you a clue. Here it is through the power of God's word. James 4, 7 says, submit yourself to God and the devil will flee from you. Come near to God. And how do we come near to God? Through his word. So 
Here we go. Here is the last point, but it's the most important. And, and you know, we're all growing spiritually to understand this is such a big idea. And by the way, if you're like, why did, because everybody knew it was like this, what in the world the church is making such a big deal about the Bible for? I don't understand. This is why. <laughs> this is why. The word of God is the most powerful spiritual weapon you have. You might say, if I would ask you, what's the most powerful weapon you have? You might have said prayer, but learning how to pray and the power of prayer actually comes from here. The word of God is the most powerful spiritual weapon you have. And let's see what it says. Ephesians 6 tells us, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. There's this mighty power living inside of you. Be strong in it. Well, how? How do we do that? And it's the word of God teaches us. It says, here's what you got to do. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. Well, how do I put on the full armor of God? I'm going to try to teach you, and this week I'm going to give you six things to memorize. Not six sentences, not six paragraphs, six little things that will change your life and to begin to practice this to change your thinking forever and to be able to do anything with the power of God. So here's what it says to do. Put on the full armor of God. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So the first thing is this belt of truth. And what you do, and as we're growing spiritually, we come to church like, I came, I didn't believe in this. You should all cross a line where you make this the foundation of your life, the foundation of, of your marriage, the foundation of your family. It is the most powerful, most important thing you can do can do. And if you haven't done that, I will recommend you do it today. I'm just going to, I got nothing better. <laughs> I, I don't like all of it. Yeah, I, I hate, oh, I was going to say something. I'll say it now. You don't even have to believe in all of it. I didn't believe in all of it when I made that foundation at all. God take care of all that. God change all that. God take care of all that. You make this the foundation of your life, of your marriage. If you haven't done that, I challenge you to, to do that today. But it says, so you stand firm with the belt of truth. So you remember that you always have the belt of truth. And then it says with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Even when you're a Christian, I mean, I'm a pastor and I'm getting this condemnation. You stink, you're no good, blah, blah. And we all wrestle with these kind of thoughts. You can never have a great marriage. You can never be a great dad, blah, blah, blah. Whatever that is for you. You can never get your health in order, blah, whatever that is for you. No, man, you stand firm with the breastplate of righteousness. And when you're being convicted of sin, oh, I blew it. Oh, I blew it this morning. I didn't say hello to somebody. Oh, I got mad at somebody on the way to church. You put on the breastplate of righteousness and you remember that the blood of Jesus is the strongest cleansing agent in the history of the world. And from the time you ask for God to come into your life, all your sins are washed away and you are the righteousness of Christ. And when you remember some sin and you're feeling all terrible, you're just like, no man, that is washed away. I'm not in my sins anymore. I am the righteousness of Christ. You've got to remember that. You've got to get that and just own that and say that. We put on the helmet of salvation and, and we remember that, that the penalty for all of our sins are washed away. Man, I love this verse, 2 Timothy 1.7, because I'm a guy who's mine. I date a lot of alcohol and drugs and killed a lot of brain cells. And for a while, I couldn't even read. I couldn't even talk. And here's a verse from the Bible. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Some of you are like, I am messed up. God will give you a sound mind to do incredible things. Whoa. We cover our feet with the gospel of peace. There's this new life. There's this new peace that passes all understanding. Do you, do you believe this? That the worst thing in the world that can happen to you, if there's a terrorist attack today, if you get cancer today, the worst thing that can happen to you in the world, you're going to heaven forever. Whew, that is peaceful. That's the gospel, peace, that God has the victory. Whoa! And then finally, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You have his word. You, you, you read other books, that this book reads you. You look at other books to get into God, it's through this book that God gets into you. You look to other books, how do I change? How do I be a better person? This book changes you and makes you a better person. 
There's that, there's that scripture in there about it. Um, it's, it's sharper than a double-edged sword, and it cuts, and it adds words. Some versions are like bone and marrow, and I'm like, Ugh, I don't know what that's all about. I love this. I, I heard this this week. That means that it, 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 it cuts out your wounds and heals you. The word of God cuts out your wounds and heals you. You know, I came here because my wife left me and we began to sense there was hope. We moved back in in our marriage. God is healing our marriage. But ever since I was a teenager, I had a little bit of a problem called a pornography problem. And I know nobody in this church has ever looked at pornography or anything. I'm clearly aware of that because you're all great Christian people. But uh, so, man, I have a terrible porn problem. I have a porn collection and porn, and that's part of our marriage. And I did all that, and that causes a lot of problems. And I don't even care. I, in fact, I believe I will just die this way. You just die this. That's just part of life, man. Just a thing. I'm growing spiritually, and all of a sudden, I didn't, <laughs> this is God's weird. I didn't ask. <laughs> I didn't do anything. God pretty much just said to me, it's time for that to die. It's time for that to go. And one day, <laughs> I'm cleaning out my drawers of all this junk, and my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm throwing this crap away. Where did that come from? here. It's just powerful. God just does stuff. He just heals you. The more you grow, the more he heals you. Psalm 107 says, God sent his word to heal them. It's the most powerful thing you ever have. So when you're wrestling with some area of your life, you study this. And you claim the victory and you just say, no, 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 no. I'm changing my thoughts right now. I have the victory because Jesus rose from the dead, man. I'm claiming the victory right now, right now. And that's the power to change everything. I want you to memorize those six things. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, foot gear preparedness, seal of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. You study this part of the Bible and when your thinking's messed up, and it will be, I'm writing a message on thinking and my thinking gets messed up writing a message on thinking. Right? Then you use that, the word of God, to change your thinking and the victory is yours. In a minute, we're gonna celebrate communion. The fact that we have the victory and I just want you to walk, I want you to think about this. In fact, go here, because I got to go here, but go here with me. You're going to Israel 2,000 years ago. Jesus lived a perfect life. Everything about him was awesome. Could you imagine meeting somebody perfect? I have some pretty good people I know that are pretty awesome. He's perfect. And he says, come on, guys, come on. This is the Last Supper. Come, come with me. They're like, what are you talking about, the Last Supper? You're awesome. What do you mean it's the Last Supper? And in the middle of supper, he takes this bread with just 12 people in like this cave. And he's like, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I, I'm thinking I wasn't there. They're like, what are you talking about? Then, and it's a sacrificial system, this is the blood of the new covenant. Drink this in remembrance of me. Do this, do this, you guys. Remember this, do this. Okay, that night, that night they come get him. <laughs> and they beat the heck out of him. And there at Golgotha, where we have victory and victory over everything, he said, it is finished. And he died and he rose from the dead. He appeared to them. So he's dead. He, whoa. And then he rose from the dead. So now the 2,000 years ago, the early church is starting. Sean's not leading worship. You're aware of that, right? There's no written word. There's no buildings. It's underground, man. There's Jews who can't figure this out. There's Romans who are running the world. This is an underground movement. And what did they do? They would go to houses. They'd be like, Jesus was God. He came to forgive us for all of our sins. He was God. He rose from the dead. We saw him and I've seen him. So what do we do? Remember, remember what he said? 
you take that piece of bread. You remember that that is his body broken for me for victory. And you take that cup and you dip that in the cup. And that is the blood of Jesus for the righteousness of Christ for the rest of your life for everybody. And there will be a day when we will be in heaven with Jesus breaking bread and drinking. And there will be a day, you know, I did so much bad stuff to my mom, I got to serve her communion. And there will be a day that I will be in heaven with my mom and Jesus having communion. And we celebrate all that and the victory of our lives and of our thoughts. It's too much to take in, you guys. It's too much to take in. There's three kinds of people in this world. There are those that go through life and never get this, that they're forgiven for their sins. It's the saddest thing in the world to me. I would, I would literally die for people to know this because it's just too good. One day, it's too good. That's what VBS is all about. That's why you need to invite everybody. There are people that will come to church and they are gonna go to heaven, but they're never free. They never experience the, the power of God. Ah, oh, what a weight. That's playing church. That's worse. The Bible says this is lukewarm. Better be hot or cold. But then there are those people that come to church and discover Jesus is alive and the power of God's word. And they begin to get victory in their life and God uses them for stuff. They do stuff like teach VBS and serve breakfast and God uses them to build his kingdom and they get all these victories and they use their story for his glory and they find this whole new life. That's what God wants for everybody. That's yours, you just, just keep coming back and grow and own it. And so when we, if you're new and you're like, what are they freaking out for about communion? Because this thing is too stinking good to be true. That's what it's about. And we want you to experience that. Would you pray with me? Father God, you can't really quite understand what kind of God would give up his son for us, but you did. And we can't quite understand what kind of God would wash away all of our sins, but you did. It's already done. We just need to ask for it. If you've never said, God, forgive me for all my sins, right now, right now. I'm telling you, you're here for a reason. It's that simple. Just say, God, forgive me for all my sins. And we want you to be part of our family and to grow and change and be a part of this this movement, this thing, this Jesus thing that has nothing to do with religion. It's just awesome. So God, we love you and we praise you and we come to your table now to do what you taught us how to do 2,000 years ago. Thank you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.